slavery is condoned in the Bible, in both Testaments, and in the Quran. There's no... No, no, it's not. Uh, it's not condoned. Assuming that it's going to be there and making rules to do it fairly instead of doing it unfairly, which was happening, that's not the case. And I'm going to talk a little bit more at some point about the problem of slavery and what the Bible actually says about slavery. But no, it's not. Sam, your facts are wrong. Now, Quran, I'm not an expert. I just know that I read the Quran and it's always about hating enemies and I just kind of got sick of it. No getting away from that. Now, you can yes, say, sir, well, it's, it's not the central thrust of any of these. No, Sam, it's not, it's not that it's just not the central thrust. It doesn't condone it. Condoning slavery would be, if you don't have slaves, you better get them. I want you to have one, you know, fifth of your population must be slaves. Even it, it doesn't have to be a central theme. It's not even a side point. It never says thou shalt have slaves. And to hear what you're saying, Sam, that's what it sounds like. If you're not saying that God is commanding that slaves must always exist somewhere, then you should be talking differently because it sounds like that's what you could be saying. Again, if, you know, on a symposium, I would be asking to clarify your point more. Now, the, the issue with slavery, I might as well talk about this a little bit now, with the problem of slavery. Much more that could be said. But what does the Bible say about slavery? Let's look at Isaiah, and let's look at Micah 4.4. 4. Let's look at Zechariah 3.10, and let's go look at Luke 4.18. And then we've got the book of Philemon. Actually, you've got Isaiah and these other Old Testament prophets. These are a little bit later Old Testament the prophets are prophesying about what's going to happen when the Messiah comes back or whatever. The Messiah is on earth and there's a, this, this time, it's a millennium reign, a thousand year reign, Revelation says, when the Messiah is reigning as, 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 the, Jew, as the, the, the Jewish one world dictator and everything's just so wonderful for a thousand years, 1,000, not 2,000, 1,000 years. And in that time, the, the, the books I just described, Micah, Zechariah, Isaiah, they say that no man, no longer will one man build a house and another man will live in it. If you build the house, you'll be able to live in it. That doesn't say your friends aren't allowed to help you, but you're not going to be the one building, building, building. Oh, I'm just getting paid. This isn't mine. You, you're, that's not going to happen anymore. No longer will one man be working in the farm fields, but another man is getting the food. And he's not, he's, that's not his, that's someone else's work that he's doing. No, you know, it doesn't say you can't help your friends, but this is actually describing employment. It, when, when, when the Bible describes the ideal utopia, millennial utopia that's coming, slavery isn't there, Sam. And you're not saying peep about this. And Jordan, you're not asking him to either, because you're not familiar about this topic either. When, when we look at that end utopia, it's not, not, of course we don't see slavery anywhere. Not only do we not see slavery, we don't see employment. There's much more that I'm going to say about this when I talk about the problem of slavery. But the, the, the Bible isn't saying this. Now that's Old Testament. That's old, now the prophets in the later part of the Old Testament, Isaiah, and then we've got Micah 4.4 4 and, and Zechariah 3.10. But then... We've got Luke 4, 18 and 19, where Jesus shows up and he says, uh, I've come to proclaim uh, release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind. And, and, and this is the verse 19. This is the favorable year of the Lord. The Lord is giving his favor this year. And there's a lot to unpack with language in Jewish tradition and stuff. But the, the, Jesus comes released to the captives. In other words, Jesus knows that they're not released yet. There's already been prophecy of this distant utopian 1,000 year period in the future when there won't, not only would there not be slavery, there won't even be employment. Now, just think about this hermeneutically, thinking back, in that millennial time when employment is unheard of because there's so much prosperity and everything is so incredibly fair, from that future time, looking back on our days, they're going to think that employment is oppression. And they're going to read our newspapers where Donald J. Trump is boasting about all the jobs he created and the Democrats are saying, no, you didn't, you liar. 
because both assume that employment is a good thing and the people in that millennial time period are going to look back on our days where we want employment because things are so bad that we don't know are so bad. And they're going to say, what evil, horrible people to have employment. Why didn't they eradicate it right away? Oh, that's what they're going to do to us if they look on us how you, Sam, are looking on those times thousands of years ago in the Old Testament. So this is, part of this is one, Sam, knowing what the Bible actually does say about slavery. And the second thing is about to the time period in hermeneutics. Now, Sam, I've made an argument. If you're man enough, show up. I keep saying that, I know. Show up on my symposium, and I want to hear what you have to say about this, because I don't think that's the end of your argument. I just want you to become better, Sam. I really think that I could have heard better from you in this debate. Not, maybe not that time we're learning, but next time I, in life, I want to hear better from you, Sam. So I'm going to move on, hear what else you're saying that I disagree with, that I want you to say better next time. Books. But if you, if you go to the books and try to figure out what the creator of the universe wants with respect wants, to the wants, owning. Wants. So he wants, with respect to the owning. Okay, what he wants. You said it, wants. There's nothing to say, I want this. The word want doesn't show up or anything similar or anything that implies it. It's, it, it, it seems to be a pre-existing situation that's presumed that it's going to continue on some level. That's different from wanting it. That's different from wanting it. Presuming something is not a powerful thing to do, and we talked about that with your Ivy League tactics. So just because something's presumed doesn't mean that it's agreed to, because we've got to do our diligence if we're going to get people to agree with us. And so God presumes it, but he's not, he's not agreeing with it. There's a, there's a difference. Sometimes there's things that you cannot change, and that goes into patience. We're talking 2 Peter 3, 9, Sam, where, and Jordan, you should have brought this up, man. God is not slow as some count slowness, how they, what they mean by slowness. God is patient, not wanting any to perish, but that all would come to repentance because there's an interchange that must happen on the inside. And from what happens on the inside, life around us is better. Sam, you talk about wanting to make the world a better place. It begins in the heart. We have to look there. I think you agree. So while God wants to deal with a slavery issue, the reason why there's so much slavery in the world, in the ancient world, at, and, and whatever problems you have today is because of conditions going on in the heart. And God wants the world to be a better place, but he's dealing with the bigger first, not necessarily more important, but the sequentially first and bigger heart issue first. It's easier to, to build cities and tear them down than it is to change the human heart. And that's where God's focus is in the Old Testament. And that's even why, not Jesus, but the Apostle Paul, Sam, get your facts straight, that's why, I suppose Jesus might have said it sometimes, but the big arguments for Sam's, honor your masters, that comes from Paul's talk. And if you're going to quote it, it, Paul should get a lot of the credit for that. So, all right, what, but, but whatever. Okay, so I'm, I'm the Bible geek and I'm the walking concordance. So no discredit to Sam. It's not your background. No discredit. So you've got, um, you've got Paul saying, slaves, honor your masters. Well, that's because love is going to overcome tanks. I mean, we're talking about, you know, the nuns stuffing flowers in the barrels of the tanks, you know. You know, love is the bigger issue. And if you have a slave who's nice and kind to his master, it could melt his heart. And then you've got Philemon. Paul writes a letter to Philemon. A slave had run away. The penalty for that's death. Very easy to get caught. We don't want this guy to die. They're both Christians. Jesus has gone, so Christians Christians didn't exist while Jesus was on earth. Christians came after Jesus left, for the record, Sam. Jordan, you should clarify that when Sam, if Sam doesn't know. And here we are after. We've got this thing called Christians now, uh, not just followers of the way, which they were known before that. And this slave had run away. Well, the slave's a Christian, and the mass slave master was a Christian. Well, you know, when, when Jesus comes in and starts to make everybody better, you know, you, you inherit all these old problems from our old former stupidity. This is this has always been a dilemma in in Christianity. You know, some guy repents, wants a new life, but he's got the life that he had before. What's he going to do now? So Paul writes this very diplomatic. It's kind of a Reagan style. He actually uses humor in the letter. Not going to talk about that here. Lots written on the Book of Philemon, and he uses humor, play on words, a little bit of Greek rhyming that doesn't come through in the English, and he's very cute and very diplomatic. 
And, and basically he says, the, the punchline is, not only please don't kill him, you could execute him under law, um, it's your choice as the plaintiff, not only don't kill this slave that ran away, but please free him. Don't, don't accept him back as a slave. I'm not returning to you in hopes that he's going to be a slave. I'm returning him to you because we have a love issue that's a greater issue because we want to make the world a better place, not just this slave issue in the house right here. As horrible as that is, there's the world. And so love, this slave's coming back to you as a token of love. Now show it back to him and receive him as a fellow brother and free him. And Paul asks him to do this. Sam, why didn't you mention that? Jordan, why didn't you tell Sam that he should have mentioned that? No, this is not a God in a Bible that's advocating slavery, Sam. Facts. Now come on the symposium podcast with me and tell me what you think about that. You got time to formulate your thoughts, but I want to hear what you have to say now. And, and needless immiseration of other people. It is. Slavery right? is really terrible. He expects you to keep it slaves, really and he's told you how to do it. No, I don't know.